Hans Holzer was a well-known author and parapsychologist, whose written work, which included 120 books on the subject of the paranormal, spanned from the early 1960s through to the 21st century. Born in Vienna, Austria in 1920, Hans and his family moved to New York in 1938, out of fear of the ever-looming war which would consume Europe for six years. This is the place where Hans Holzer would remain, to carve out his career as one of the most prolific ghost hunters of his generation. While probably best known for his investigation into the often disputed Amityville haunting, there are numerous other houses and alleged hauntings that Holzer has been associated with. This is just one of them. According to Peter Underwood's 1985 book The Ghost Hunters, Holzer's already budding interest in the paranormal was encouraged when he became friends with a New York journalist named Denton Walker. It was the 1950s and Walker had recently bought a house in Rockland County which lies to the south of New York. Walker was convinced that the place was haunted. Hans Holzer, who visited the house with fellow famed parapsychologist Eileen Garrett, also became convinced. In fact, Holzer said that it was one of the most interesting cases he had ever been involved in. Denton Walker explained that he had heard sounds in and around the house, sounds of which there was no apparent source, and he said that he always felt that someone or something was trying to get into the building. On at least two nights, he was awakened by a loud knocking at the door, only to return to his bedroom baffled, because there was no one there. Denton Walker had a live-in servant who claimed to have similar experiences, so much so that he eventually refused to stay in the house alone. One guest, after spending two nights there, left saying he would never be able to sleep in the house again. On another occasion, a pewter jug, which was in near-perfect condition, was found to have clear thumb and finger indents, as if someone had grasped it tightly enough to warp the metal. It was a Saturday afternoon when Hans Holzer, Eileen Garrett, her secretary and a magazine journalist entered the Rockland County dwelling. Eileen Garrett pointed out one of the upstairs bedrooms as the most affected area of the house. There in the bedroom she settled into a chair and while the rest of the party were downstairs she described to Denton Walker her psychic impressions of the house in its past. She explained that the road that abruptly ends at the front of the house once carried on through the site of the property and beyond, leading up to the foot of the Ramapo Mountains. She confidently claimed that the bedroom had once been partitioned and used as a storeroom for grain and fruit, and that she had a clear sense of someone kneeling at the window, acting as a lookout and brandishing a gun. Uncertain of the latter claim, Walker confirmed that he had moved the room's partition himself when he moved in. Eileen Garrett then called everyone in the house into the bedroom, and as they gathered around the chair, she fell into what was described as a cataleptic state. Her eyes rolled back and she began to convulse violently. After a few moments, she fell off the chair and lay on the ground clutching her head as if in pain, and speaking in a deep, masculine voice and broken English. She held out her hands in defensive poses, screamed out in pain, and nursed what appeared to be an injured leg. During her violent trance, she told the story of a Polish mercenary who was chased into the house during the Revolutionary War by British troops. There he hid out of sight before eventually being found and badly beaten. His leg was broken, his head was beaten in and his teeth were knocked out. Surviving the ordeal, he remained in the house for several days, before eventually dying from his injuries. Whether this was theatre or a true experience of the paranormal, the onlookers did not know but it went on for almost an hour before Garrett came back to her senses. During his retelling of the story to Peter Underwood, Denton Walker exclaimed that Eileen Garrett was either a very good actress or she was genuinely possessed. So were the inexplicable events that occurred in his house caused by the tortured spirit of a Polish mercenary, Walker Denton couldn't be sure. However, he could not deny that the atmosphere in the house was greatly improved following Eileen Garrett's visit and he went on to spend many peaceful days and nights there. What's more, on further investigation, and true to Garrett's claims, Walker found out that the road that abruptly ended in front of the house did in fact run to the foot of the Ramapo Mountains, where it's said US troops hid their horses from the British during the American Revolutionary War.
This house stands on Birmingham Road in the town of Kidderminster, England. In May of 1959 it became the new home of Mr and Mrs Halstead and their nine children. Almost as soon as they'd moved in, and for the next eight months, according to the family, they had heard loud thudding, crashing and dragging sounds, along with footsteps coming from one of the bedrooms of the Victorian era property. Whenever they went to investigate, there was no signs of life. The unexplained noises were almost a daily occurrence, and the Housesteads, especially the children, became so traumatised that in December of 1959, eight months after they'd moved in, they appealed to the Kidderminster Corporation's housing officer to find them a new place to live. When asked why it took them eight months to make the request, they stated that recently the noises had become much more frequent, louder and drawn out for longer lengths of time. Besides, they were afraid to speak out about the tales of a possible haunting for fear of being ridiculed by neighbours. When the disembodied sounds reached their peak during the second week of December 1959, three members of the Birmingham Psychic Research Society, led by a Mr L.A. Payne, agreed to visit the family on December 20th. They were quick to disregard the Housestead's claims. After spending just 90 minutes in the house, they left with the opinion that there was nothing there of a paranormal nature. Mr Payne later said that if the disturbances continued, then he would consider a more thorough investigation. The story attracted attention from the local press, and on December 18th, 1959, Mrs Halstead was quoted by the Birmingham Daily Post as saying, All I care about now is moving. I shall be a nervous wreck if I stay here much longer. I could not find out how long the Halstead family remained in the property, but the former owner's death, which gave way to the Halstead's occupancy, may, or may not, hold the answer to their experience. According to this headline, the local press certainly wanted people to think so. A once wealthy man by the name of John Robinson used to own the property, and for ten years prior to the Halsteads, he lived there alone. An engineer by trade, he became increasingly frustrated with the government's refusal to fairly compensate him for the requisitioning of his factory during the Second World War. Because of this, he refused to pay a penny to the state, padlocked his gates, and sealed his letterbox to stop the delivery of payment demands and court summonses. He was declared bankrupt by his creditors in 1955. John Robinson eventually became a recluse, according to the press, and died alone in the house in May of 1958. His body was found a month later. His cousin, who inherited the house, sold it to a property developer, and the Halstead family moved in in May of 1959, exactly one year after the lonesome death of John Robinson. On the edge of South Somerset in England lies the town of Yeovil. In the town centre on Middle Street is the remnants of the Elephant and Castle Inn. The building opened its doors as a public house and hotel in 1860 and served as such for 117 years under various managements. Before 1860 it housed a blacksmith and cutler. Although no longer a public house and hotel, much of the original structure remains. Even the Elephant and Castle name remains along the front of the building as it looked in 1977 when it finally closed its doors for business. The building's history involves a tragic story, although this story is not thought to be linked to its haunting. The story goes that the first licensee of the pub, a man by the name of Job Osmond, acquired the establishment in 1860 and ran it with his wife Sophia until his death two years later. On Tuesday, April 1st, 1862, Mr. Osmond threw himself from the window of one of the above rooms. It was reported at the time that his wife caught him in the act and tried to stop him, but was unsuccessful. Although Osmond survived the fall, he died of his internal injuries soon after. At the inquest into his death, it was agreed that Mr. Osmond had thrown himself from the building in a state of temporary insanity. As mentioned before, this story serves only as a glimpse into the building's history and does not appear, at least, to be linked to the sightings of an apparition of a woman thought to be in her twenties. A former landlady of the pub named Mrs Sword stated sometime in the 1970s 
that she had seen the woman several times and that she wore a long white gown, a kind of headdress, and carried a candle or lamp with her. Mrs. Sword believed that what she saw was the apparition of a former maid or employee of the hotel. She also mentioned that there was a lot of noise at night, loud thudding, the moving of cutlery in the kitchen, and the stacking of plates, but when the noises were investigated, nothing was ever found to explain it. I was unable to pinpoint a year for these reported incidents, but it must have been sometime between 1965 and 1977, because there is no specific named licensee listed between these dates, and Mrs. Sword's name is not listed as a licensee before 1965. These next reported accounts are equally vague, as no date or year was mentioned. It's said that a man who once stayed in one of the rooms of the hotel claimed to have been woken up at around 5am and was faced with a ghostly apparition, again of a young woman, who he described as being around 24 years old, wearing a long white gown and headdress that covered most of her hair. He said that after a few moments she disappeared into the wall of the bedroom, first passing through a wardrobe. Another visitor described the woman as small, and, as with the other accounts, was wearing a white gown and carrying with her a nightlight of some kind. Another online source states that the apparition has also been seen carrying a sword, but I couldn't find any actual account that mentions this. The late Peter Underwood, as many of you will know, is one of the most respected paranormal investigators the world has seen. For me, his level-headedness, his tendency to steer well clear of sensationalism, and the fact that he was always sceptical, even of his own findings, makes this account all the more chilling. In 1986, he told this story to the London-based LBC radio station. It concerns an incident that occurred at the Newark Park House in the Cotswolds in the county of Gloucestershire. Underwood and his team of investigators paid the place a visit after there had been numerous reports of whispering voices, footsteps and rustling sounds on one particular staircase. He said that they had waited on this staircase for hours in sheer darkness and, like on so many other night vigils before, experienced nothing out of the ordinary. They then heard a sudden rustling sound coming from the landing at the top of the stairs. They quickly pointed their one camera in the general direction that the sound came from, with the intention of taking a photograph of the landing if the noise was heard again. By Underwood's own account, they waited for a further three or four hours, but with no further activity occurring, the team moved to a different room, where they ate some food and planned to retire to their bedrooms. While they ate, they listened to the recording of the night's apparently fruitless vigil. At one stage of the recording, Underwood claims that they heard two very clear voices. One was a male voice, which said, It's looking. This was immediately followed by a female voice, which said, It's looking at us. He assured LBC Radio that no one in the team spoke during the recording, and believes that the disembodied voices were from another time and were referring to the investigator's camera. This tale comes from the state of Louisiana, and is based on a story relayed by a soldier named John, who was a military police officer in the Air Force Reserves. In late August of 2005, John, along with other members of the Air Force Reserves, were patrolling the streets of New Orleans offering food, water and what little medicine remained following the devastation left behind by Hurricane Katrina, which had made landfall a few days before. They were also offering transport to those who were left with nowhere to live and wanted to evacuate. The mission, he said, was made difficult due to the bad feeling between the people of New Orleans and the military as there was a strong belief, fueled by media reports, that the military were harassing the people of New Orleans, rather than showing support. John stated that this simply wasn't true, and they were just there to help fellow Americans. There was one incident, he recalls, whilst patrolling the Ninth Ward, which lies to the east of the city, and was one of the worst affected areas. The officers were calling out to the now boarded up houses, explaining who they were and their purpose. After a while, some people began to emerge from their devastated homes. 
When asked if they wanted to evacuate, many refused for fear of their homes being looted and losing what little possessions they had left. The ones who agreed joined the unit. As the officers scanned the flood-battered houses, they noticed one house that stood out. It looked a lot older than the ones immediately surrounding it. John said that it resembled a plantation house from the Civil War era, just not as grand. Unlike the other houses, it was not boarded up. As John scanned the building, he noticed a young girl stood in the window of the second floor. He smiled and waved to reassure her that he was there to help, and that she had nothing to fear. She smiled and waved back from what I could tell, John said. He called out asking where her parents were, but she just stood and watched him. After many hours of military service in some of the most war-stricken areas of the world, John said that a kind of sixth sense told him that something wasn't quite right. He focused on the girl, wondering why amidst this devastation she looked happy and unaffected by the nightmare that surrounded them. As John's attention from the girl waned, an old man rode up on his bike and asked if he and seven members of his family could be evacuated. John told him he'd be happy to help, but then asked about the old house. He pointed out the window on the second floor and asked if he knew anything about the family who lived there and the young girl, who by now had moved away from the window. The old man smiled, put his hand on John's shoulder and said, You saw her too. Son, ain't no one lived in that house for a hundred years. The old man then rode away to fetch his family, but as he did, John heard him say, Some things about New Orleans are better left unsaid. <laughs>